Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Emmanuel United Church of Christ, where we have a passion for God and compassion for all. We like to start off this morning by reminding everyone that we have an absolutely delicious brunch ready for today. We have breakfast sandwiches, which will be served after worship time in the fellowship hall. We want to say happy birthday this week to Gail and Paul and John Hamlin and to Doreen as well as to Monique. We want to say happy anniversary to the Bussards. And today, our message is a bit of a mini sermon. I want to share two realities with you. One is the reality of Top Ramon noodles or Raymond noodles. How many people have ever eaten Raymond noodles? All right. The other reality is a hundred dollar bill. I share this because today Emmanuel UCC is living between these two realities. Last week we shared that fortunately because of your generosity, we had received more than we spent. But if you also remember, I said we're kind of like a family in which we're living paycheck to paycheck. The church is 32 years old. You all remember what it was like to be 32 raising a family, right? This week is a Raymond, Soodle, Raymond Noodle Soup week. The reason why is because this is the week in which we had to pay our health benefits and our quarterly insurance, which together came to over $6,000. So what that means is we are now about $2,000 behind in what we need to keep the church running. However, like any young 32-year-old who has a family, you know that after the week of Raymond Soup, if you budgeted wisely and you've held on to your pennies, you get to have another week in which maybe you get to have some steak or maybe a dessert. This morning, someone who wasn't aware of our beard fundraiser discovered it and the first thing they did was pull out a hundred dollar bill to go towards it. So, amen. I share this because isn't that the reality of life and being 32? And isn't that the reality of our faith so often? We're in the wilderness, we're worried about if we're gonna survive, and God says, guess what? I'm gonna send you some manna from heaven but you need to go and collect it. And that's where we are. Now, another part of the manna is that, you know, Easter's coming up. And we deserve to have a really good Easter. God deserves to have a really good Easter celebration. So this year, we are encouraging everyone once again to wear hats in celebration of Easter. But I want to go a step further. I would love, considering all the pain and struggle and trauma we've gone through for the past two years, not only wear hats, but if you got white gloves, wear those. If you got high heels, wear those. If you got a pocketbook, wear those. And I have all three. And men, men, I think we want to see you dressed up in suits just like people used to do in the 50s and 60s. Can we get an amen about that? Amen. amen. It shouldn't just be the women having to wear stuff. The men should be as well. Now, the good news is Miss Cynthia, in honor of our beloved Sue Tucker, has offered that she will gladly donate a dollar for each person who wears a hat. That includes men as well. What we would love to find is someone to sponsor the men who wear suits and because we are an ONA church and we're inclusive, women can wear suits as well. That is totally fine. And maybe if Tracy comes in a dress, we'll be really, really blessed. But isn't it good that even when the family is facing a ramen soup week, 
that we can still laugh and believe in the promise of tomorrow, that's a gift. So because of that gift, you are invited to now silence your cell phones. And whatever stress or worries from the week before, now is the time to set aside and let us all rise in faith as we join with our musicians in singing our mission theme song.
Christ we have found the light, let us now turn to our neighbors and safely extend to them a sign of welcome and grace. And knowing that we have sisters and brothers watching us at home, let us turn to the camera and also extend to them a sign of welcome and grace. And you may face forward. Christ is our advocate, leading us to the light of righteousness. No matter what tragic mistakes we have made, we can take them before Jesus and lay them at his feet. Let us now enter into a time of silent reflection. And because we know that Christ was willing to go to the cross for us, we also know that God is one who forgives. And with that knowledge, let us say, the Lord listens to our hearts, forgives our sins, and shines upon us. We are surrounded by grace and not forgotten. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah, 
Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom was from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You said I am a king, for I was born. For this I was born, and for this I came to the world to testify to the truth. Anyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is truth? Very good question. <laughs> says only Jesus is the truth, by the way. <laughs> Please join with me in a moment of censoring prayer. Gracious and Holy One, we come before you today aware that life is full of joy and it is full of sorrow. It is full of life and it is also full of loss. And we bring all of these realities to your feet, asking that your Holy Spirit continue to descend upon us, allowing us to meditate on your word and to perhaps continuing to learn just a little bit more about you. It is in your son's name we pray and we say, Amen. 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 <clears throat> so, over the past few months, we've had this privilege of studying the Gospel of John. And we've really spent a lot of time in the Gospel of John, time that I have never spent before. And we've had the opportunity to watch all the people that Jesus interacts with, to hear all the words that Jesus has to say. And now we're at that place in which Jesus is now coming before not only the religious leaders of his day, but the political leaders of his day. And it's so often that pastors are often told by members of their congregation that they don't believe that politics and religion mix. There's a lot of people who believe that pastors should never say anything that is considered to be political. And to be honest with you, 21 years ago, I would have fully agreed. 20 year, 21 years ago when I went to seminary, my faith was all about miracles and healing and courage and the unknown taking place. But then over the years began to realize if you're living in a world that's just in kind, you wouldn't need miracles. If you were living in a world in which you didn't have to struggle with your health or your finances or being welcomed or unwelcomed, why would you need courage? So began to understand that when it comes to the Bible, and when it comes to Jesus, and when it comes to Christianity, we are being asked to hold two realities in our hand at the same time. Just like the ramen soup and the $100 bill, religion is asking us to hold spirituality and the reality of the world all at the same time. You know, when you think about it, the Bible itself is really political. We just don't like to talk about it. But there are books called Kings. The whole story of the Exodus is about slaves being set free from Egypt. The writers were political. When you read the prophets, it is so amazing how the things the prophets talk about could be the very things that prophets would be talking about today. You read the prophets of the Old Testament and you'll hear how they'll talk about unfair rent, people losing their housing, unfair wages, foreign invasions, and the mistreatment of immigrants and women and children. And we have to realize that Jesus Christ, in the very nature of his own ministry, was political. Now, he was definitely spiritual, definitely compassionate, but the things he said and did also had a political component. You know the story about him meeting the woman at the well? 
That's the story of Jesus meeting a despised foreigner at a place and talking to them with equality and compassion. The story is about Jesus feeding the hungry, offering wellness to individuals and the opportunity to earn a wage. How much time in our current political climate is being devoted to issues like health care and poverty and women's rights? The ministry of Jesus spoke to the political climate of the time. It was the time in which a foreign government, Rome, had went into Judah, had attacked them, and had taken over the nation. Then there's the ministry that Jesus addressed in the temple and the synagogues. Jesus, through his own public speaking and public teaching, offered a connection to to God that often went across the way that the temple was offering connection. The ministry Jesus offered did not involve money changers overcharging fees or clergy demanding that they had the fattest calf so that way they could eat that for dinner. And if there's any doubt about just how spiritual and political Jesus' ministry was, all we have to do is look at today's scripture. The religious leaders had taken Jesus into the government headquarters. He's questioned by the Roman military governor, and in just four verses, the words king is used three times, nation is used one time, kingdom is used three times, and world is referred to three times. King, nation, kingdom, world. These are all political terms. But the question becomes, well, why does that matter? And why are you making us listen to this today? Because we have to understand that Pilate is a military governor and he's asking Jesus if he's the king of the Jews. Pilate is not asking him, are you the spiritual king of the Jews? To fully understand this story, think of what's going on in Ukraine today. Think of Pilate being Putin and Jesus being the president of the Ukraine. What Pilate is really asking, according to modern theologians, is this. Pilate is asking Jesus, are you the one who's going to stir the pot and lead a revolt? And are you the one who's going to get your people excited enough that they're going to wage war with us and kick us out of your country? That's how amazingly powerful Jesus is. That's how strong his presence and his words and his understanding of God and scripture is. That a soldier, that a man who has a full army at his disposal is afraid that Jesus, this one peaceful person, is going to lead a whole rebellion against his nation and his nation could possibly lose that battle. Pilate is saying in today's reading, Are you going to stir up trouble and try to usurp the current administration? Pilate is so worried. He is so worried that Jesus is going to lead some kind of march or a protest or a boycott. And Jesus, unwavering and with only his words, says, My kingdom is not from this world. If it was, my followers would be revolting already. So, says Pilate, are you a king? Jesus says, you say that I'm a king, but I came to speak to the truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? And I want to be very careful at this moment but I almost feel like we watched Jesus' interactions this week on the television screen. 
Because if you notice, as much as Pilate tries to get Jesus to dig himself into a hole, Jesus does not answer. Jesus doesn't need to answer. Because we have witnessed all along that the kingdom of God that Jesus is representing is a completely different kingdom than what we see in this world. The kingdom of God that Jesus is representing is one in which there is enough for all, there is equality for all, there is forgiveness, and there is also fellowship. Enough, equality, forgiveness, and fellowship. These are all spiritual, but they're also all political. God showed us, or Jesus showed us, God's economy. An economy in which there is enough for all. That God has given us everything that we need, so we learn how to trust God, and we learn how to use what it is that we need. Now we see God's economy in the instance when water is turned into that delicious and abundant wine. We see God's economy on the mountain when Jesus is able to feed all those thousands of people. No one is turned away. Everyone is fed. And if you remember, there's enough left over that they are able to gather 12 baskets worth. A quality. Jesus is so amazing in his acts of equality. In a culture in which women were considered to be less than, and foreign women were to not only be seen as less than, but despised, we have this amazing story in which Jesus talks to a foreign woman at a well, and he talks to her as an equal. And then we have that powerful story in which Mary and Martha are unafraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus, and their words moves our Lord to tears. We see beggars being treated with the ability to be willing workers. We see that the blind are worthy of getting our hands dirty for, and we see Jesus saying that anyone who comes to him, he will not discard like a piece of trash. We learn through Jesus that in God's kingdom, there's forgiveness. Now, we haven't talked about this story yet, but I'm sure that a lot of people here know the story about the woman who was caught committing adultery. Even back then, 2,000 years ago, the issue of a woman's right and a woman's choice with what she's going to do with her body was still being under control of others. And if you remember, the people of that time wanted to drag her out and kill her. And instead of joining the mob, or agreeing with the life sentence, or an execution of her, do you remember what Jesus said? Those without sin, those who have not made a tragic mistake, may you be the first to throw a stone. I don't think we realize how amazing that act of forgiveness is, because how often do we have Christians who the mere moment something happens, what do they want? They want to see you in jail, or they want to see the death penalty. The final thing that we want to talk about today is fellowship. And you may ask, well, how is fellowship political? Fellowship in its very nation, nature is the ability to welcome someone in, to let someone sit beside you, and to allow someone to share in your festivities and meals and parties. And in a culture at a time in which it was all about who's in and who's out, who's welcome here, who's not welcome here, the very fact that Jesus went into people's homes the very fact that Jesus sat with people of questionable background, the very fact that Jesus would sit and eat with people who historically were told, you are not good enough, the very fact that Jesus would get on his hands and knees and nothing but a robe and act as a servant and wash people's feet. Yes, that's spiritual, but ask anyone who's ever been excluded just how radical it is 
that Jesus had open fellowship. The kingdom of God, as presented by Jesus, is one in which God has created the world in such a way and given us enough that we're encouraged to give thanks, to take just what we need, and to share with others. The kingdom of God, as presented by Jesus, is one in which men and women, native-born and foreigner, are welcomed and seen as equals. The kingdom of God, as presented by Jesus, is one in which the forgiveness of sins and mistakes takes place over vicious punishments. And the kingdom of God, as presented by Jesus, is one in which everyone is welcome to gather without worry, without fear, without hierarchy, and without having to change who they are. In closing, I hope you can hear just how spiritual and political this is, how Jesus became a threat to both the religious leaders and the political leaders of his day. But I could also hope that you can hear just how radical the ministry of Jesus Christ really is and just how radical it is when a person or a congregation or an entire community live that the kingdom of God is real as it is on heaven and on earth. And for that, I believe we can say, Amen. During this time, you are now invited to have your own reflection about what the experience of Jesus means to you. Gracious and holy God, we started today's service by referring to your agape love as both mother and father. And we know that there is so much going on in our county and our country and our world that we could be praying for today. But today we are praying for hearts. We are praying for Kim and Joellen Lathwell as they continue to go through the journey they are on. And we ask that you are able to move through Kim, to place a spirit of calmness and trust upon him, that he is able to live into the existence you have granted him. We are mindful of all of those involved with the IMAG program and how right now they are being heckled at and having lies told about them. But Holy One, especially today, in light of all that Jesus is about to go through, we are mindful of our own families and our own situations. We are mindful that there are mothers who are celebrating the birthdays of sons who have overcome great tragedy. We are mindful today that there are sons who dearly miss their moms in the relationship they never got to have. Holy One, we are mindful that there are fathers who are worried about their daughters and their children, and so many who are concerned about their grandbabies. And Lord, today we especially lift up Mel and Maureen and Marla, knowing that today is not an easy day. And so we are lifting up and mindful of Mike, for the life he lived and the people he loved, and for his loss, which is still greatly felt until today. We know that you are a God who cares about so much, but today we are going to be selfful and ask that you look upon us, that you touch our hearts, and you allow us to move through this week knowing that no matter what, you are beside us. And whatever problems are in the world, we trust that you will take care of. But for today, Lord, it is about our own sorrows and joys. 
It is in your son's name we pray and we say. Here. 
Uh, here as a church, we are never really ever having steak. Uh, we're, uh, in the good times, we're having hamburger helper and a lot of stew <laughs> with a lot of potatoes in it. But I want to tell you how special it is. Up until this church, uh, I grew up in a really strong church family. And you do not know how important I find the church family. You don't know how happy I am to be someplace where I do not have to have conversations about overthrowing the government and Black Lives Matter are the same thing, okay? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just so disturbing. Yeah, I don't know how happy I am that my grandchildren can come here with their two moms and basically walk in the door and not have people look at my daughter-in-law and ask her if she's the nanny. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have an enormous mission here, guys. And I just don't, you know, when it comes to this church and when it comes to the things that I believe in, I budget to it. Okay, and if that's not where you are, please consider it. You know, in your monthly budget, it should be about your emergency fund. It should be about your uh, and your church community because we are a beacon in this county, in a county where I've attended churches where they're, they're telling me things like, hey, yeah, we like gays. Now, should they get married? No. You know, the most basic thing about being able to be with and to be legally bound to your, the person you love, that's not, that, apparently that's not what their Jesus wants. Their Jesus wants judgment, the absence of choice, and you know, just not Jesus' love. They, don't, they, they honestly do not believe in Jesus' love. So when you're thinking about this church, please think about it right there after the rent, the mortgage, the light bill, your emergency fund, and then it comes here, and you know, let's dig deep, because we are in our emergency fund. We are paying our bills every month. When he said this was a lean month, it's because we're digging into our emergency fund. And who wants to do that, guys? I mean, if you're financially back, you know, kind of person like me, we do not want to be in our emergency fund. Don't get distressed about it. Get mad, get serious, and budget. And budget us into your life.
uh, let me lead you in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power forever, Lord, forever. Amen. It'd be nice to be <laughs> this week <laughs> and she is going to check your ledger and make sure that after you paid your mortgage your electric bill and your emergency fund you have a manual UCC down I have never in my entire life including going to a Pentecostal church heard an offering given that way and you know what Eileen thank you I would rather yes yes I would rather be a pastor who eats stew with lots of potatoes than a pastor who eats lobster but dares to say to your daughter-in-law, are you the man? Yes. What a blessing to know that when we talk about sharing resources, it can come down to as simple as your daughter-in-law being acknowledged for who she is. If that is not Christ, I don't know what is. Amen. So, with that being said, we have brunch immediately after worship. <laughs> Hospitality is looking for someone who could help serve on April 10th. Palm Sunday, which is in two weeks, we're going to have a special musical presentation from Miss Carol. But we decided it's time to do another percussive worship service. So if you remember before COVID hit, we did one. You are invited to bring anything with you that can make a noise. We don't care if it's drums or castanets or if it's pennies in a coffee can. We are going to make as much joyful noise as we can on Palm Sunday. 
And then remember, wear your Easter hats, wear your gloves, your high heels, your suits for Easter Sunday. And we just want to close out by saying, we began today's worship with $3,100 towards the Beard Fund. Thanks to our generous donor, we now have 3200 which means $1,800 more, and you will get to see not only my baby face, but how I have a Lego blocked shaped head now. <laughs> and that is okay. And not only that, but the barber has agreed to come in Easter morning if council feels it's appropriate, and he will actually shave me in the narthex for anyone who wants to watch. Norma, do you really have to clap? Thank you. <laughs> And the Wygants, we want to give thanks for your family is here, knowing that today is such an emotionally difficult day. And we thank you for taking what could have been very painful and is painful and transforming it into worship. That's truly what you did. Can we get an amen? amen. I invite you now to please rise on your feet for the benediction. Friends and family and those who have traveled from afar but are near and dear to our hearts, as we prepare to leave this holy space and to leave this holy time, may we never forget that the words of Jesus make a difference and that the spirit of Jesus gives us the strength and the encouragement to do all that must be done. May we step out into God's beautiful creation with the ability to do justice, to love being kind, and to continually, humbly, faithfully walk with our Lord and Creator. And may everyone say, Amen. Amen. Then sing my soul, my Savior God to thee. Remember practice this Wednesday and praise the practice.